Good afternoon, dear students of ID 6208, System Integration and Architecture 1. I am your OLC, Ms. Karen Delara, and welcome to our virtual class today. So we will be discussing the following factors affecting system complexity, coupling, cohesion, input design, output design, and forms design. Factors affecting system complexity. To develop good quality of system software, it is necessary to develop a good design. Therefore, the main focus on while developing the design of the system is the quality of the software design. A good quality software design is the one which minimizes the complexity and cost expenditure in software development. The two important concepts related to the system development that help in determining the complexity of a system are coupling and cohesion. So what is coupling? Coupling is the measure of the independence of components. It defines the degree of dependency of each module of system development on the other. In practice, this means the stronger the coupling between the modules in a system, the more difficult it is to implement and maintain the system. Each module should have simple, clean interface with other modules and that the minimum number of data elements should be shared between modules. So there are various types of coupling. So we have the high coupling and this type of systems have interconnections with program units dependent on each other. Changes to one subsystem leads to high impact on the other subsystem. Another type is the low coupling. So this type of systems are made up of components which are independent or almost independent. A change in one subsystem does not affect any other subsystem. Coupling measures. We have content coupling. When one component actually modifies another, then the modified component is completely dependent on modifying one. Common coupling. When amount of coupling is reduced somewhat by organizing system design so that data are accessible from a common data store. Control coupling, when one component passes parameters to control the activity of another component. Stamp coupling, when data structures is used to pass information from one component to another. And data coupling, when only data is passed, then components are connected by this coupling. Next, let us define what is cohesion. Cohesion is the measure of closeness of the relationship between its components. It defines the amount of dependency of the components of a module on one another. In practice, this means the systems designer must ensure that they do not split essential processes into fragmented modules. They do not gather together unrelated processes represented as processes on the data flow diagram or DFT into meaningless modules. The best modules are those that are functionally cohesive. The worst modules are those that are coincidentally cohesive. The worst degree of cohesion. Coincidental cohesion is found in a component whose parts are unrelated to another. Logical cohesion, it is where several logically related functions or data elements are placed in same component. Temporal cohesion, it is when a component that is used to initialize a system or set variables perform several functions in sequence, but the functions are related by timing involved. Procedurally cohesion, it is when functions are grouped together in a component just to ensure this order. Sequential cohesion, it is when the output from one part of a component is the input to the next part of it. Next, we have the input design. In an information system or IS, input is the raw data that is processed to produce output. During the input design, the developers must consider the input devices. Therefore, 
the quality of system input determines the quality of system output. Well-designed input forms and screens have the following properties. It should serve specific purpose effectively, such as storing, recording, and retrieving the information. It ensures proper completion with accuracy. It should be easy to fill and straightforward. It should focus on users' attention, consistency, and simplicity. All these objectives are obtained using the knowledge of basic design principles regarding what are the inputs needed for the system and how end users respond to different elements of forms and screens. Objectives for input design. To design data entry and input procedures, to reduce input volume, to design source documents for data capture or devise other data capture methods, to design input data records, data entry screens, and user interface screens, to use validation checks and develop effective input controls. Data input methods. It is important to design appropriate data input methods to prevent errors while entering data. These methods depend on whether the data is entered by customers in forms manually and later entered by data entry operators or data is directly entered by users on the personal computers. A system should prevent user from making mistakes by Clear form design by leaving enough space for writing legibly. Clear instructions to fill form. Clear form design. Reducing keystrokes and immediate error feedback. Some of the popular data input methods are batch input method or also known as offline data input method, online data input method, computer-readable forms, and interactive data input. Input integrity controls. So this include a number of methods to eliminate common input errors by end users. They also include checks on the value of individual fields, both for format and the completeness of all inputs. Audit rails for data entry and other system operations are created using transaction logs, which gives a record of all changes introduced in the database to provide security and means of recovery in case of any failure. Now let's proceed with output design. The design of output is the most important task of any system. During output design, developers identify the type of outputs needed and consider the necessary output controls and prototype report layouts. So the objectives of output design are to develop output design that serves the intended purpose and eliminates the production of unwanted output, to develop the output design that meets the end user's requirements, to deliver the appropriate quantity of output, to form the output in appropriate format and direct it to the right person, to make the output available on time for making good decisions. Types of outputs, external outputs. Manufacturers create and design external outputs for printers. External outputs enable the system to leave the trigger actions on the part of their recipients or confirm actions to their recipients. Some of the external outputs are designed as turnaround outputs, which are implemented as a form and re-enter the system as an input. Internal outputs are present inside the system and used by end users and managers. They support the management in decision making and reporting. So there are three types of reports produced by management information. First is the detailed reports. They contain present information which has almost no filtering or restriction generated to assist management planning and control. Second is the summary reports. 
they contain trends and potential problems which are categorized and summarized that are generated for managers who do not want details. And the third one is the exception reports. They contain exceptions, filtered data to some condition or standard before presenting it to the managers as information. Output integrity controls, so this include routing codes to identify the receiving system and verification messages to confirm successful receipt of messages that are handled by network protocol. Printed or screen format reports should include a date and time for report printing and the data. Multi-page reports contain report title or description and pagination. Pre-printed forms usually include a version number and effective date. Next, we have the forms design. Both forms and reports are the product of input and output design and our business document consisting of specified data. The main difference is that forms provide fields for data input, but reports are purely used for reading. For example, order forms, employment, and credit application. So during form designing, the designer should know who will use them, where would they be delivered, the purpose of the form or report, and during form design, automated design tools enhance the developer's ability to prototype forms and reports and present them to end users for evaluation. Objectives of good form design are to keep the screen simple by giving proper sequence, information, and clear captions, to meet the intended purpose by using appropriate forms, to ensure the completion of form with accuracy, to keep the forms attractive by using icons, inverse video, or blinking cursors, to facilitate navigation. So now let's proceed with the different types of forms. We have flat forms. It is a single copy form prepared manually or by a machine and printed on a paper. For additional copies of the original, carbon papers are inserted between copies. So it is a simplest and inexpensive form to design, print and reproduce, which uses less volume. Next, we have the unit set or the snap out forms. So these are papers with one-time carbons interleaved into unit sets for either handwritten or machine use. Carbons may be either blue or black, standard grade medium intensity. Generally, blue carbons are best for handwritten forms, while black carbons are best for machine use. Next, we have the continuous strip or the fan fold forms. So these are multiple unit forms joined in a continuous strip with perforations between each pair of forms. It is a less expensive method for large volume use. Next, we have the no carbon required or NCR paper. They use carbonless papers which have two chemical coatings or capsules, one on the face and the other on the back of a sheet of paper. When pressure is applied, the two capsules interact and create an image. So if you have any questions, please send a message through the LMS chat box, or you can also email me at kvdelara at amaes.edu.ph. Thank you for listening, and thank you for attending our virtual class today.